are trying to come back down the table from our past conversations for these workshops. And I hope that the public, if you are tuning in, that you're still able to hear and engage just as you were before when we were on the dais. If you are there and there's any problems, please let us know so we can do it accordingly. We're going to go ahead and start with um, our roll call, please. Council Member Dennehy, absent. Council Member Schmisher, absent. Council Member B. Smith, absent. Council Member Stein, here. Council Member Tracy, here. Council Member Worthington, here. Mayor Pro Tem Hamrick, here. Mayor Smith, here. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, Ryan, we're going to turn the time over to you and our staff, please. So tonight we're going to be talking about the comprehensive plan action matrix. So last year we completed our comprehensive plan looking out uh, 10, 15 years uh, into the future. What's, uh, what, what does the community want to see in the, those goals? And part of that project is putting together an action matrix, a list of, I think it's 330 roughly items to uh, take a look at. And uh, what we have uh, in your packets, uh, we've segmented these into things that we're currently doing, uh, things that might be in design, things that have not been started. Uh, what we're looking for from council is direction on where you want to slot in some of the things that are currently not defined, with, where it falls in that in that time. Um, you'll see within the action matrix. Uh, we have uh, some dates that are already put in there uh, based off of information that we already know. And another column that you're going to see is uh, whether or not there's funding. So there's uh, city dash F if it's funded, city dash U if it's unfunded. You're going to see uh, some of those city dash U designations next to. Uh, Years, uh, so either 2024. Uh, that means those are things that are probably going to show up in the budget as a budget request um, coming to city council as we go through the budget process. Um, but otherwise, uh, and, and uh, you'll also see some places where it says grants. So we either apply for a grant or we're receiving a grant uh, and, um, for, to help fund some of those um, particular things. Uh, you know, maybe the window there grants out there uh, that we can apply for but have not yet. So there's no time to um, uh, With that, we'll go ahead and get started. Unless Patrick or Rick have anything they want to add before we get started? Nope. What I have done is I have broken this down into the sections. So we've got 5A, 5B, uh, so on, all the way through to 9. I have removed items in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. If, um, you know, if it says funded or ongoing, uh, trying to focus more so on the things that say unfunded or uh, we don't have a clear direction on uh, to you know, for that purpose, get direction on. Uh, the first section, uh, 5A, is land use and development. Uh, we do have uh, 5A1. We've slotted that as uh, that was meant to be something that we would do at the end of the comprehensive plan period, towards the end of that 10 year period. Uh, it is unfunded uh, regarding that this uh, feasibility study for the mile the annex. Uh, so we, we have that kind of slotted in there. At this point, I don't think we need any direction unless there is uh, another opinion of council at this point. And if there, uh, I know it's tiny up there, that's why I'm glad you all have your spreadsheets with you. Um, if there are items that we, uh, we've not put into the presentation that you want to talk about, please let me know in the back of the discussion. Uh, 5B under residential areas. Uh, this has been consolidated a little bit. Um, so, mostly focusing on the quality of the So, 5B15 and 5B20. 
ensuring adequate code enforcement staffing to maintain consistent operations. Uh, we see a budget year 2023 and that it's unfunded. Uh, expect that the police department will be asking for an additional code enforcement person um, to help um, meet that so that that work. Uh, 5B16, second bit. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. Um, I, am, I did not go back and cross reference with the comprehensive plan itself when I was doing this, but I had thought that to mean um, both building code enforcement and code code enforcement. So I'm wondering if we're getting to building code later. Uh, actually, 5B17 is a brief substandard okay. housing and unmaintained properties. So the plan just said that is. <laughs> So it fits in a little bit more with the okay. enforcement. Um, and you see there with the current on the budget here for the plan to build uh, the enforcement. So, uh, probably some additional ordinances that we might want to consider. Um, I was thinking about it more from the reverse in terms of people having um, ongoing challenges with uh, some of some of the code that we've developed to have and kind of the time frames. So I was wondering if part of our quality uh, was ensuring had this time frame. I understand what the question is. So I mean, I think that we've heard that there are, are challenges around with our, our building department um, in terms of the timeline for uh, for review, um, and the, so not necessarily on substandard and unmaintained properties, but rather when people are trying to build new properties or renovate properties, it seems like part of that challenge might be staffing. So, so I'm wondering if that if that is part of yeah. this or not. From, I don't think that's part of this, but from that standpoint, uh, what we looked at is uh, whether or not to continue to send things out to third party review for potential reviews. Um, most of our home uh, reviews, so for some of them, uh, these are completed with those reviews. Um, so. Yeah, I would say that that would be true. And that as far as going to bringing commercial back in, I mean, we recently went through the commercial process and it does take. Well, actually, engineering and architecture takes the longest, not necessarily the city part. The city part was actually the easiest to get through. But I could see a value instead of having somebody, not even just in Colorado Springs, because the company's so big, somebody's like in Indiana or wherever. It would be nice to have somebody in house we could sit down and have conversations with, and that they understand and know us and our nuances and really those particular properties that would. And, and it costs a lot of money to go through that process to the third party. And to spend that much, it would be, I think there could be some benefits to have that under our control, especially if we want to have those opportunities to say, you know, for old buildings, we want to make sure we make it better, not necessarily up to every single brand new build standard, you know, things like that, that they can have that flexibility for it. So that, that was something that we were looking at was bringing that uh, function in-house uh, with the and the economic uncertainty and possible recession might be um, likely to be something that we can push on. So you're saying pushing off in house to 2024 just oh be because of the see how many permits we actually pull. Yeah, not knowing what's gonna happen with commercial plan. Because we are we are seeing a slowdown this year. Um I'm looking at the quality. I mean, it's like I want us to have adequate co enforcement, especially that's customer friendly and workable with our business. But I don't also want to go crazy over the top with it either. I, I was actually a little bit more interested in the um, like the housing options and attainability with working with developers and builders to evaluate attainable housing incentives. And offer affordable housing density bonuses and looking for you know more multifamily properties to promote and things like, like that. You know, maybe other things that we think of as we go through it all in terms of and I don't know if it's good or a bad idea to talk about all of those potential 
things that might drive additional staff, but in some way we may sooner or later have to get to a point where we're prioritizing, you know, are we going to prioritize code enforcement additional staff above something else or Mm -hmm. right well in our like substandard housing that was a huge huge problem about six years ago i'm curious how much of a problem that is now i know we spend a lot of money now on doing a lot of the abatements which but that's new that's new for us and it sounds like there could be more i don't know is with the short of edge housing we found that other people are buying these properties and taking care of it themselves <laughs> In, in some instances, yes, we're you know, we're seeing uh, overall vacancy rates have, have decreased over the last ten years uh, from ten percent down to probably like six to seven percent. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a lot of these houses that were vacant or not being uh, you know, uh, put back into the market after they've been renovated. But we, you know, we used to maintain the list, and that, that's one of the items that we're going to um, start maintaining that list again. Properties that we are we aware of. Either. That would be really interesting because I would say yeah. that it used, when we did have that list, it was a good solid 30 to 40 houses. I'm wondering if now we're, if we're just left with a few like super hard, difficult. <laughs> hard, hard, hard. <laughs> some, you know, some of them are hard and difficult. Some of them, you know, you know as we were talking about the last uh, Monday, um, they're trying to find the owner of record that will return your call to, to try and get the uh, assets back on the market. It's, we're having issues with asbestos or anything when we start. When you do abatement, does that mean any carry down and stuff too? So I would assume that really adds cost to things. So, in order to do a demo uh, demolition, um, the building department uh, requires, and it's a state requirement, oh, okay. uh, a clean uh, bill of health, health of asbestos. Uh, and we have to have a notice from the state saying that it's maybe you have to be all So, so, so Ryan, on on this, you know, the the way this came about is we said we need to revise our master plan because it's been you know a long time since we've done it, many many years. Okay, uh, and and so that we brought in House Seal Levine, and they went through and they went through the process with them uh, and to to devise a new master plan for the city. And as they went through it, what we said, what we told them we wanted was at the end of the day, we wanted an action list of things that we can do to be implementing the, the, the action plan as we go along. And it seems to me that, the, you know, if, if, you know, just looking at the, at the length and number of things here, it is, it's truly impossible to get your head around Without without a lot more structure in it, some way, and that's what that's what you've been trying to do, and, and all that's really good. Part of the tension that we have is that we've got our visionary plan, the master plan that says, "Hey, here's the things, here's the things we want to do, here's the directions we want the city to go," with the sausage making on top, you know, on top of the sausage making of the day to day city operations, and because. That's a that's a that's a live process, and there's no telling what you know what new development is going to walk in the door tomorrow and say, hey, I, you know, here, look at this thing. I want the city to focus attention on that. Because of those because of those considerations, it's really hard to take this down to to really a truly action plan level where we have you know because. If if this is if this ends up being an action plan, you almost start need to start talking about Gantt charts and things like that, where you have it planned out by month what's going to happen, you know. And and so I'm the I'm just I'm saying this because because for me it's going to be really hard for me to go through and say yeah oh hey I want you to do that you know because 
three pages later, I may say, oh, wait, wait a minute, what about this, you know? And well, so it's, yeah. it, is, it is really hard to get it down to the, the, the critical few or some preliminary sort or something like that. When we first got this, I tried to do that. I took, I believe I put in a spreadsheet and I looked at it tonight before I came here. The, uh, the, all the priority one items, all the priority two items, and all the priority three items. And the, the, you know, like I said, part of the problem is that we have priority three items that are ongoing, you know, and so, and, and, and things happen, you know, so, but, so you, what you uh, talk to us a little bit more about really what you, you know, other than, than, than saying you're looking for guidance because the, we've, it's, it's way too big to be able to speak intelligently or, you know, um, in the city's best interest to give you that guidance, be given, given the scope of it. I know, even if I could have just clicked you know, on a digital thing and clicked on, okay, I wanna see all the A's for E's, or I wanna just look at all the ones together or all the twos together. And Cause I was just to wrap around like how to codify everything. It and, was and then my mind, which is not necessarily helpful to anybody. <laughs> I started thinking about, well, where's, you know, we're spending a lot of time on homelessness issues. And I don't yeah, think that exactly. stood out here. Or I have a personal desire to do more about uh, fire mitigation in the community. And there's a little on that, but maybe. So, if, yeah, I, I don't know. I agree with what you're saying. And my guess is, and I should try to speak for staff, but I'll bet that this is difficult for staff, too. <laughs> well, <laughs> One of the problems I see is the fact that you get to the point and say, okay, never mind, we're just going to keep the day to day stuff going because this is too much. You know, and that happens. We all know that we all do these great studies and stuff, and then they get put up on the shelf. You know, I was impressed with this. I mean, mm -hmm. but like you say, my goodness, how the heck do you begin to do it, but you don't want to forget about it either. So it's finding that happy medium. Well, so many of them aren't actually action items. They're like, no. protect this, increase that. Yeah. It's not actually an action sure. item. Sure. Right. Right. You know, a lot of great ideas and a lot of things that we all want to be doing. Yeah. yeah. Like, how do you turn that into a. Right. When, when, when you see ongoing. Next to the, you know, the right. that's why uh, we put ongoing. Right. Yeah, like which is like a gazillion rows down. Yeah, a, lot <laughs> that, a lot of that stuff falls on the Patrick Rick, right? Family yes. director. That when we're reviewing proposals or we're getting, you know, getting ready to do public projects, that we have to take those things into account. So that a lot of those things just get baked into the sausages, you could put it. <laughs> um, as we as we go, I think um, there's some of those things that adequate code enforcement, for example. You know, if you have a team with a supervisor, three FTEs. Yeah, so, which is know, big. We, I mean, that's pretty big for us. We've never been that big in my history. Well, we, but previously we had two uh, animal control and two code enforcement. Um, so uh, we combined those several years ago. So the, the number of the FTE camp has stayed the same, gotcha. but the responsibilities have been combined into a uh, <coughs> services division. So is there some document or have you put any uh, effort into uh, uh, coordinating or uh, integrating this with the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard. The balance scorecard. Yeah, so the, the balance scorecard looks at you know we we've got some items where um, you know it's making progress against the, these types of plans. It's not necessarily integrating individual items, but making sure that we're um, you know things that we're budgeting for, things that we're uh, we're working towards in, in different department action plans are taken into account, um, not just the comprehensive plan, but some of the other plans, the industry analysis and our downtown plan and all the other things that we've worked on over the years, uh, making sure that we're planning for those things and, and executing against some of those action plans. 
Sure, I, I, I can see where other plans will are you know have have inputs or affect or are you know a goal of a balance scorecard. But but on this, is there have we have we you know is there is there any is there a key between all of these items and our balance scorecard somewhere? Not a direct. Like I would imagine that if, once we get our priorities, that would make that more reasonable too, because this would be really hard. To yeah, and, that, and yeah. that's why it's you know it's more about you know number of uh, projects and priorities uh, against those projects, uh, not necessarily specific items. Like a percentage or. And we've identified that we're going to do X number for 2023 and that kind of thing before. Can you know what the scorecard is? Yes. Very important. And we'll have a session in August. Don't rush. No, such a Okay. There's one of those things that I, during orientation, we glossed over because there's a whole lot of coverage. But it's a, it's a strategic way of um, departments to, to do their work and, and have measures and metrics. And it's, it's, it's a pyramid structure. Yeah. You start at the top and work down. So you, you set goals at the top and each level below that says what they're going to do to carry out those goals until you kind of get down to the frontline workers. And the point is, is that you get buy-in with everybody. Everyone understands what we're what the piece of the buy-in. Right. And it's also a way to actually make people accountable. Yeah. If this is what we're going to achieve, how do we know whether or not we're actually achieving it? Can I ask, since we have um, Rick and Patrick here, do you guys use this? And if so, how do you use it? Um, I, I, well, we all went through it. But like you in your day to day work. In the day to day, no, um, do I look at it and say, I need to do that? No, I, I, I looked at this and said, what am I doing now that's meeting these already? Identify what is like I'm going up, I'm going. Um, it gives you a point of direction, sure. though, which the balance book card does also. Probably somewhat on a much higher level, I mean, much lower level, I guess, this gives direction. Um, but it's really more a matter of determining what, what am I doing now to meet this and looking at it and thinking, what can I do in the year? Um, so no, not necessarily. I need to do this next year. Next year, next year. I also have the industry study I'm trying to work through too. Um, and these they coincide in some respects. But as far as like a daily planning or a monthly planning or daily planning, uh, it's more of a. Are we going in the right direction based on what this is? And, and a lot of what we've checked off. In our meeting, we talked about this. Was on go. You see a lot of on go because a lot of what they were suggesting we do in this is actually being addressed in a lot of ways. It's just not necessarily the focus of the position. Sure, that would help, and maybe it's just a psychological thing. But if if all of the ongoing were pulled out of here, particularly the ones that are you know, just those value statements, assist business owners looking to invest in or improve their properties. I mean, that's a general, it's like, yeah, this is what I'm gonna live by every day and like my job. If we pull that out and then took another look, would that help us focus a little better on how to prioritize? And I keep thinking of the Gantt chart thing too. The poor Gantt charts, those were perk charts. And one of the advantages to both of those kinds of work planning is it says time frame. It's not only who's responsible, but when does it begin and when should it be done and what has to come before another piece. Not to make life more complicated. It seems like that would be more usable for a day-to-day -day basis. I think that might also help us understand where trade-offs might have to happen at right. our staffing levels. Like ongoing activity you can do with your current staff because you're out of this way. So if we were able to identify just the things that are complicated <coughs> Not already being done, we could then maybe have a conversation about are you able to do this? But maybe, maybe, that, maybe you've already done that, and that's why we're just talking about the question marks. Um, yeah, I, well, I think 
part of the reason why we're talking about question marks. And I understand where those trade offs have to be there. Uh, and some of these things happen across different departments or different divisions. So Got a lot of folks that might be working on something somewhere in parks and open space, for example. Because when I put together the presentation, that that is where we have the most question marks because there's a lot of stuff that's really nice in that in the comprehensive plan, but missing a lot of funding and a lot of staff there to do that. Yeah. Right. We have to make sure that the nature of the also, I don't think that that's anything that's in there at all. I think for the leader of the Sierra's district to decide that. There's a lot to get to. There is a lot to get to. But you know, as far as ongoing, and you know, yes, we're managing it with current staffing, but you know, that's part of the reason you know, we see requests for additional staffing because you know, Patrick and Rick have their, their jobs, and the, the more you stack on top of that, the more. Those uh, responsibilities need to be done. So, and also, as far as our land is concerned, we call it ongoing, but what does it mean to you? If there's anything that's a red flag in here that you don't see as ongoing, but we think it's ongoing, what, how are you defining the digital year? And what does that mean to you? Uh, should we be looking in another direction? One is develop housing types that are accessible and affordable. Yeah, what does that mean? Because there's housing types that don't necessarily code or um, cause a lot of contention when you're talking about them in the city, actually, between me and them. Container homes. Intermodal shipping containers. But, you know, so yeah. to some extent, and I'm not sure, I'm not saying that every line needs guidance, but to some extent, there's something in here that's highly important to you um, as a group. Then it would help to know it and, and know what your priorities are. Maybe we need to focus a little more attention on something that's on to consider. So there is a lot to digest. I think there'll probably be more than one meeting on this, but we do need to whittle it down a little bit so that you guys can digest kind of where our priorities, you know, combine together where the priorities need to be. So we should probably just keep going. It looks like we're going section by section and we'll see. And then we'll, we'll see where, at the end of our, you know, our limit, our mental capacities and time capacities today, where we want to go next with it. That's it. Um, so we are still in <laughs> the very first <laughs> section. Second section. <laughs> well, I wanted to go back to the first though because I wanted. They also talked about, you know, some of the easy like priority one A's as far as priority mm -hmm. one A for easy things like flexible water tap cost residential developments, you know, yeah, that's an easy one. And I think that is a really appropriate because I think for a lot of these developments that want to come in, but now with the higher costs of doing business or building, this is one way we can help. Which we have as a one aid because we have the water tap incentive. Incentive. Three quarter inch water tap size the house. So is that more of a check mark like Done, or do we need to continue to have flexibility for some of these bigger developments that are just not like, oh, I'm putting in, you know, a couple of townhouses versus I'm putting in 20 townhouses. And my question is, when you give that kind of break, do does the general fund reimburse the water or enterprise fund, or how do you handle that? Yeah. <clears throat> right now, isn't it that the water fund just? Takes it even short, so to speak. Oh, and we're paying those higher rates. <laughs> well, we're not. And the other thing is, that, is that we're, you know, based on what we've heard from the water fund, is that is that we have funding problems here, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to it. You know, and that's one reason replacement of aging. Okay. So I would say with that one, for example, actually, I would think it is ongoing because we've passed this incentive, but it expires. So it's a thing that we will have to review again okay. when it comes to that. So that's but it's not one that requires a daily action. No, right. It's, right. It's, it's a tool that we use when you know, Rick or Patrick are talking to developers and you know, letting them know that we have uh, these types of incentives in place. Because um, well, one thing, water taps, uh, the fee itself is not getting up. It's only 15 years. Uh, 
you know, our water taps compared to a lot of other water taps or especially yeah. uh, but there, there's also uh, since the water taps have, there are a lot of communities that have changed the nomenclature as well. We don't call them water taps anymore. They're plant investment fees and things like that. Or um, you know, water taps uh, plant investment fees, they call it. You know, that goes to the long-term maintenance of the uh, expansion of the facility itself. We've talked to black kids. Whereas you know, we can we use rates to maintain the water lines and put in new water lines and things like that. So okay. Okay, I can appreciate that. Is there anything else, though, from Council on this first section you want to kind of identify as important to you before we move on? You mean 5A or 5B? 5B. 5B. I was going to say for the code enforcement volunteer effort, we did have one probably pre COVID. And if, I mean, we are, we're, have, we're in the process of hiring a new supervisor, but if that's something they're interested in, I mean, that's something that could help. Meet our needs without spending a lot of money. But you're talking about the keep kick and clean. Yeah. Yes. And I wonder if something like that, when I read through here, if we decide at some point to get into more public education around fire mitigation, maybe a team like that, a volunteer team, could be focused in this area and also focused on that's a fire hazard over there. Let's figure out how to get that cleaned up. Um, to kind of go beyond just the narrow right well and that kind of goes with 5b20 when it talks about advertised grants and low interest loans and tax credits to property owners for private property improvements but we could probably tag in their state and fire mitigation grants too because the state has a lot of grants for homeowners to mitigate their their property and that would be nice you know it would be an appropriate place maybe to add that Yeah, I was talking to the fire chief days ago and he mentioned the Dawson Ranch Homeowners Association. Well, that there's actually a community wildfire protection plan. Mm -hmm. I see. Chippewa Program. Yeah. One direction on the side of the community in terms of operating permit units. Yeah, that's certainly something that's. Uh, as far as you know, where do you want them? Uh, obviously, a lot of these things they need their own general government or vision mm -hmm. for discussion or, or retreats. So, you know, for something like that, you know, what we're looking for is where do you want to slot that in as far as you know, discussion timelines? Well, I, I was kind of curious about it because I mean, some of the, as I said earlier, I don't want to be too heavy handed with a stick like setting visible code violations before the complaints even occur. But I definitely prefer incentives that incentivize people to make the choice for themselves to make the improvements that we want to see or that where we're really lacking or need help. And that is definitely more of a carrot. And so I like that more. And I think the discussion mentioned about what we're I can add anything on 18, which ties into 16. When I see something that keep can clean to, I see that as much more of a public information type of a thing. People in their own neighborhoods, they don't necessarily go to someone's house and you know start cleaning up, but they but keep the neighborhood clean, keep can clean, but more of a buying your property. Just on that, I wonder if we should um, not to add many, many more things to Christie's thought, but I wonder if that really is more of a public information. Obviously, we have a huge public really trying to get out. That's my opinion. Yeah. I was going to say something like that. Well, it's time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 5C uh, has to do with economic development. So, yeah, we see a lot of uh, ongoing or short term. Uh, one of the things, yeah. uh, one of the things that's uh, 
you know, when, when you're going through this process with comprehensive plan, uh, you know, a lot of suggestions, especially when it came back to development, um, that we either had in the pipeline or some of that stuff already. So, um, you know, continuing to work on economic development, I think some of the things that I've seen here that uh, we kind of identified. Five C thirteen in terms of force gaps. Um, that's something that's, um, that, that's going to take up some parking space. that we can see some of those things. Uh, so higher specialists to kind of do, do that workforce gap analysis. So, so I, I see that in a few examples of something. That we I think that's another better thing that's to make sure that we have PCC partners who are actually doing the training and educational training that's like full partners and whatever that's going to be designed. There's a, I mean, there, and it's not just true in the economic development items, but throughout the entire action matrix, there, there's an entire section on here for partnerships and partners. Um, so we are um, encouraging other entities to, to take So, with uh, 5C3 host an annual meeting with members of the business community, I, I feel like, Rick, that you, you put it on short term, but it seems like that would be an ongoing because you, you have done that. You just want to keep doing yeah, it. It's, it's not a formal annual meeting or anything like that. Uh, we could, and that's the only reason I put this as not having started because it's not a formal thing, but like in like the chambers and uh, uh, it would be a good thing to do. But you know, we also want to get back into the mayor's advisory council, yeah, it's kind of hand in hand, yeah, yeah. So, um, it, I guess I don't consider it ongoing because it has it, because it's somewhat sporadic, it doesn't mm. consist. So it would be nice to make it a consistent thing. It would be. Yeah. Yeah, we should probably necessary. schedule another one. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I have a quick question about let's see 5C16. I don't think that's presentation, but just remind us where we are. I know that that contract comes up sometime. Yeah, the contract comes up in 2026. Um, we're actually working uh, to schedule a meeting with the bridge. Uh, they have some proposals they'd like to bring forward. Um, they're hoping to have that meeting before the city council retreat so we can have some uh, updated terms of retreat. Were there any other staff initiatives to steer the this whole summer? And that also relates to one of the action items further down with regard, uh, with regard to establishing the way. So that would certainly be something that we can bring to the bridge as well. Yeah, they, they've had meetings with Ashley Sack regarding the work groups. And I think currently it's done you and the better than anything, but I think uh, they wanted to go back and talk more about it. So uh, actually, I think they've applied for a grant. There's a security issue on the south side of the bridge yeah. and in creating in creating a potential insurance issue in the bridge itself. Yeah. yeah. That's we need to work that out. Um, it may just be a matter of coming up with some sort of a motion detected sensor that would notify oh, security yes. when somebody's entered the park, but they need to know who's in the park, you know, for their insurance purposes. They have to know where people are going. So but I mean that's as good as putting in a kiosk where you can yeah, it's a, it's a cost thing. Yeah, it's a cost thing. Yeah, if we decide to fund it, I am pretty sure that Fire has put in a grant application to see if they can pursue that Royal Gorge Loop. Is this reestablishing where you could come in from the okay? Yeah, through the gate where it was and come in and make okay through the gate that well, not through the gate that used to be there, but allowing people to come in near that gate. Okay. Right now, they would be going through the gate until the train is done. They still are not allowed to drive over the bridge, right? But, but it, so, then how do you 
create a loop. Well, they, they would be permitted as a bicycle ramp. Oh, for those of us that are old enough, we have different wheels. Gotcha. E bike. Yeah, that's right. With a big paddle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye
up to where, you know, so that we're not still piecemealing this far over. So mm -hmm. it's a conversation of the grant funding, the third street, the bump outs, all that plus some two way. Well, I think we do need to do that kind of bigger picture planning because we are going to be doing these improvements and we have the money for it. And my time is getting limited and I'd really love to see things <laughs> happening. Yeah. 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 And the way bids have been coming in here, are, are we going to have to expand what, how much money we're going to need to do these things? I mean, I mean, seriously, they, they're coming in really high. Yeah, and it's not looking to trend down anytime soon. I mean, unless something drastic happens, um, material costs, in fact, even local material costs, they're, they're feeling the, the, the pinch as well. We had uh, an invoice come in yesterday from local um, suppliers of aggregate that is showing some increases. So it's not just stuff from the outside, it's local as well. When it comes to putting together an RFP for proposal, we, we make a best case estimate for what we think is the likely coming And we make sure that we, we put that into the bid doc and we go out for proposals. If we get proposals that exceed this, and that becomes the trend, we may have to go back and revisit the budget amount that we've got, but we don't know until we actually right. But at this point, I mean, within the next year, this mm -hmm. probably isn't going to change. Mm -hmm. But at, at this point, we're, we're planning, we need to look at scaling back what we think we want to do. Because the reality is, we can't keep finding more money. Well, I don't. I think that that's part of that master planning is the phasing of it, so that even if we can only do a little piece of it, it's still going to fit into the bigger picture eventually. Some some of what we do with I think the Reynolds projects right now is just a good example of that. So we we do middle piece, so you know we can you know we break it down into sections. So you know as the bid numbers come in, we know okay, well, this is how much money we have based on bids. We're only going to approve this section right now, and then next year we're going to have to budget. So then, then the, the timeline has to change. Mm -hmm. Something has to change. So you right. just nibble at it, nibble at it, but it's all going to contribute to that bigger picture. And really, Main Street, that section of Main Street really does need to be yeah. replaced. Mm -hmm. it's, really it's a priority. And I would say that also, including their Centennial Park Master Plan, does have some really beautiful things for Third Street. I mean, it has actually Third Street absolutely closing down and turning into a walkway. I think the general public says no, but it still has some really cool ideas that we could that makes it really special. Veterans Park. Centennial Park. It's so it, third and, and downtown. Yeah. So it has. Oh, yeah. So the Centennial Park. It also included like a connecting, mm -hmm. um, make it the clock tower, to. Highway 50 to Veterans to Centennial, so that can makes that connection to the river. And then, and then further yeah. north, the other terminus of third is an open space with all the trails associated with it. Hence, the recommendation of third be And and to interject a little bit, um, I attended the grant summit last week, um, and a lot of money is coming. We're not quite sure how we're going to manage it. Um, how they're going to manage it, how the state's going to manage it. Uh, and But there's a lot of, and it, it's truly, um, it was implemented for transportation, although there's lots of other components to it. So there's a lot of opportunity for us, transportation-wise, to get some of these projects done. Not necessarily free, but, but pretty good, right? Yes. <laughs> Leveraged. Yes. But as we're, as we're kind of getting more projects ready for, I guess, being shut down, this is about to sort of move the direction of this one. Are we delaying them as complete streets? Meaning, like, will they have bike lanes? Will they have food? So that, that's um, actually another part of the grant that we received, which is the master. Uh, it's the, it's the, the Trails <laughs> Master Plan. Um, we were we actually were awarded the full one hundred thousand for the trails master plan and only about thirty percent of the complete street design plan for Third Street. 
Trails, master plan, or transportation? It's, it doesn't it's, it's, it's an MMON, but for, for short, it's a trails master plan. But um, and that would include some third corridors, say on 15th Street, 9th Street, um, whether or not they are expansion of the sidewalks or whether or not they're bike lanes or if they're sharrows or whatever it is, those are you know, the streets that we've identified, plus the east west corridor, uh, possibly along part of 15th, getting into downtown, some other uh, places on the riverside, you know, doing some more trail work on that side, you know, kind of connecting the whole trails multimodal network. <laughs> yes. 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 yes, that's a short answer. <laughs> so, and, you know, and that, that's one of the things that's kind of nuanced about one, you know, this particular master plan, this action plan, this, you know, it calls for additional master plans like the multi -modal. And once you start getting into that, you're going to be branching off into additional action plans. So. How much staffing? <laughs> and, that, and that's something we talked about too in the grant summit. I mean, with all this money coming, where are we going to get the staff to manage it? The state is, is having a similar kind of growing pains about, you know, how, how many people are they going to have to have to, you know, facilitate these grants? And we, of course, are on the other end where we're like, well, we have a grant, but do we have the inspectors? Do we have, you know, the engineers? Do we have all those people that would take to spend the funds, basically? <clears throat> I think for me, to go back to your question, Patrick, I don't think that you can drop everything else because we need you guys to continue doing your day jobs. Well, but we also really want to see yeah. forward progress on this. And, and you know, some of that is what Kim, Kim was talking about is can we, you know, when we apply for those grant funds, can we put in extra money for third party contractors to do some of those inspections on behalf of the city? So, mm -hmm. Well, in, in some cases, in some, it depends on the it depends on the inspections. Um, there are reasons why we have in-house and a blend of both because some inspections are very specialized, which is kind of what we do. We do the specialized, not you know, run-of-the-mill inspections. You know, something that's a little different than the plans. Um, and then, of course, we have people like Vivid that do the materials testing, that kind of stuff. So, for sure. Anything else we need for this section? Can I just ask one clarifying question on FD5 is south site? Is that referring to a specific site or is that just like the south side of the river? The four reference is north side. I didn't know either if that meant side. I'm wondering if it means side as well. Yeah, that's, that's side. I think it does mean south side. South side. Okay. Yeah. South side. That's what I'm used to. It's with the yellow. Oh, so it's just mixed use building, 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 not a building, but building of mixed use. Ah. We'll go with that. <laughs> it's an interpretation. It's a good one. I think there were notifications for me to go back into. Make sure I fix it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then my one other question was also about the question marks on. Um, on 9 and 10. So is that formalized the downtown riverfront work that's ongoing? And then we've got established the downtown river wayfinding has not started. I just wasn't sure. I think the establishing is the short term and the formalizing is the midterm. So I would, but I'm not entirely sure I know the difference between establishing and formalizing these. So I wasn't sure where we were with that. Well, I think. Uh... Um, I think formalizes the planning of the downtown loop and establishing the actual wayfinding, wayfinding and places and, and things as well. So it's, having marks of yeah. pedestrians know where where the loop is. Mm -hmm. So you can't do that one until you finalize the actual route. So, so it is, um, and so where where in this is a way for people to get across 50 without moving yeah. out? <laughs> where is well, that? that's supposed to be happening this year. The pedestrian project is supposed it's to take care of that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's going to be, is it going to just going to be a like a marked walkway with flesh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they will have the beacons and everything like that. Guess. The medians. Be, they'll, 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 have, they'll have shelters uh, in, in the median. And that will then put a way to slow down traffic. <laughs> so it's supposed to work psychologically similar to the bump outs. People, when they feel constricted, they tend to slow down. So that's the intent. 
the signs that say uh, so we're so we vegetation in the medium is so it's and you know what they have in um way down south Durango. They what they have that set up and they also have flags in the western way. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they're they're in these little holders huh. <laughs> when they leave the, and then because we have a lot of uh, traffic, tourist traffic, mm -hmm. but they don't understand that you know pedestrians are not expendable. They don't. You know, if you're in this crosswalk, they don't. They won't slow down or stop. Mm -hmm. So maybe the you know, we studied Durango when we went to, I mean, it was, it's been like a six year process and Durango was one of the cities that we did study in choosing our plan. But yeah, that's supposed to be implemented this fall, hopefully. Yeah, and it's the people and people use it. I was surprised every yeah. time. So oh yeah, they have it on my yeah. son's um, college campus and nobody uses it. The, the, <laughs> the beacon down here on First Street where the trail, the front trail crosses First Street, it was not functioning for the past couple of months because of an issue with Black Hills. Oh. You would not believe how many times I had gotten an email or a phone call telling me that the beacon wasn't working because, because people use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they push the button. Right. So, well, well and I do think there is. If it's automatic. It does, it does but there's a public <laughs> education piece too, going back to, you know, people are not doing a very good job, I'll just say, yielding to pedestrians and crosswalks in this community. I think we just need to think about more enforcement, more education on that, even before the, the change that's coming at third and north gorge. Because I mean, Main Street's a problem and Ninth Street's a problem. Unfortunately, it's it's driver unawareness of what's required. Right. Some people stop when they're not even in the crosswalk. They're like still standing there, just waiting for traffic to keep going. Yeah. And the people will stop, and it's like, well, what what are we doing? What are we doing? And then when people are crossing, <clears throat> then they don't stop. It's like people just yeah. don't know. So there, yeah, I, like I just think we should focus on that. Just kind of like do a campaign about reminding people state yep. law, you stop the pedestrians and crosswalks. One of the best ways to remind people is enforcement. Yes. <laughs> I got one of those just ones. I will never forget that lesson. You have to put it on the pocketbook, unfortunately. Yeah. Yep. It makes it manual. <laughs> I remember every speeding ticket I ever got. Not that many. All right, are we good? Uh, I think it is actually time. Uh, I mean, we're moving on to transportation mobility, right? Yeah, Which yeah. is kind of the yeah. So, yeah, we, I think we've, we've been talking about this a little bit. Uh, we have some studies uh, in the works that we have grant funding for for that multimodal, uh, <laughs> continuing to, to work on uh, six eight. I think it's exactly what we're talking about with our targeted speed enforcement. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we have in here? On, on... Yeah, um, so when it comes to the U.S. Highway 50 corridor plan, we're still working on the East Access Control Plan. Uh, we had talked briefly with CDOT about this. They wanted to go ahead and uh, reestablish that. I have that in my inbox. I'm working on it right now uh, of the scope of work for them to go out to RFP and start over basically with the East Access Control Plan since we had so much issue with it last time. Um, start over from scratch? Or just... Yeah, well, they'll take some of the information they had before, but because of the, um, the resistance to access to certain businesses, they, they're wanting to take that into account, maybe try to relook at how we're going to give access to certain people and how that's going to work. And the, the other aspect of that is, I'm sorry. Is this Fremont Drive? Yeah, the, the other aspect of that is, you know, it's going to be a different consultant with the mm -hmm. folks that did our West. Yeah, the there's a West, West that we had a good relationship with. And, exactly. You know, they're, they're, you know, from their standpoint, they're probably going to want to um, make sure they, they've got all the right ingredients in the process. Yeah, they, they don't want to take a, a bad recipe. Yeah, mm -hmm. rebake it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, it'll be interesting too how that risk works for the west side too. And that it's supposed to be kind of like our little soft start experiment to see mm -hmm. if this is going to be, you know, the public's going to respond to it. Yeah. 
And, and we also have to, I mean, with this multimodal master plan that we're talking about too, it actually uh, has that east-west quarter that we're talking about, which could be a portion of Fremont Drive if and when um, it goes away. So, I mean, we can really take that strategically and say, you know, this, we're not taking away from mobility, we're actually adding to mobility. So having that integrated in there as well. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, can't we get CDOT to buy that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're, they'll give us the right of way anyway. I mean, it reverts back to us, but we'll see how that works. Um, prioritize, prioritize intersection improvements based on accident rate. It's interesting. I just got some information from CDOT on this. Uh, we're going to work on um, some numbers when it comes to uh, improvements, at least on 50. We are still doing our counting program. We invested in some new equipment for that. So that's <laughs> ongoing. Um, First Street was kind of a, a, I mean, we're looking at that, but it, it would be kind of triggered by the development that would happen around First Street. So the riverfront and um, of course, uh, Constantino's and everything like that would, would, you know, work on some of those intersection improvements. So, and I think that goes back to some discussion we were having earlier. We, you know, there's no way for us to slot in high park frames or some of these things, mm -hmm. and, you know, meeting warrants and things like that mm -hmm. for, for first street. But it's going to happen as, as development happens. And, you know, I, I think as we get closer to those types of projects, we can look back at the action plan matrix and, and <coughs> predict something based off of any activity that we have going on there at that intersection. We've also briefly talked about Fremont Drive. It you know, has to do with 15th Street, also that major uh, commercial corner where City Market is. And Rick and I are always talking about you know, various things that we could do there. So I think that uh, the East Access Control Plan will kind of maybe flush some of that. So that also well. fit in with where there's a lot of accidents potentially mm -hmm. too, which would give it some validation for a, a change needed. Agreed. It's the uh, work with business owners to resolve access issues northeast. That's what we're talking about. So um, there, it's like a it's like a kind of a triangle where the Walgreens and the city market and that traffic flow is really it's kind of goofy because yeah. um, there's really no road between the city market and the Walgreens. It's actually all private property, yet people right. use it for access oh, yeah. all the time. Plus, you know, the way that um, 15th and May was configured, and then of course the roundabout, that's all kind of a, a goofy mess. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're hoping that that will be part of the East Access Control Plan. We can work together, yeah. you know, with the discussions about that businesses about that. Control. Yeah, because ultimately, even wherever it is that Fremont Drive becomes vacated, I mean, we're going to have to determine that location, whether or not it's before the city market, after the city market, wherever it is that that, that and, and piece the master, happens. The comprehensive plan certainly made some recommendations on those in, the, in this area as well. Um, I think the only thing that I might have skipped over was the pavement study program. We're going to go over that uh, next month with the two eight. So. Mm -hmm. When I think as far as like downtown parking, I mean, as far as a parking study, Definitely, my biggest priority is just go ahead and put in the parking lot at the <laughs> restaurant cleaners. <laughs> and that's fine. Let's, 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 let's at least get one thing done, right? <laughs> I, I did have a quick comment on the electric vehicle infrastructure. I passed some information out by email on that. But I think Ryan said something not long ago about uh, maybe this was an energy committee, I don't remember, but about the slowness in getting. Uh, some of these EV things done because Black Hills couldn't get a transformer or something like that. And it was interesting to me that in CDOT's state plan, the DEBBIE plan, National uh, EV Infrastructure Plan that they're putting together to submit to the feds, in that plan, it actually talks about transformers taking 60 or more months to get right there. Yeah. So just interesting. Just so I, I, had, sorry. I had a meeting with Oscar Rangel and he is with Farage. We were talking about doing an energy audit. He was also, um, we were also talking about uh, EV infrastructure downtown, uh, being able to capitalize on some of that as far as, in, in, in as far as, you know, putting in charging stations where we would strategically put them, how we could 
you know, capitalize by using, you know, city funds to put those in, and then we would get the, the revenue from them, as well as, you know, what we're looking at when it comes to strict energy infrastructure downtown, how would we be able to fund that so that we could run those charging stations downtown without overloading the grid, as well as moving us, the city, towards moving, uh, using more EV for like sure. um, administrative cars and things like that. So we've been talking about that. And then at the uh, Energy Summit, we also talked about the grant funding that's coming down for that, uh, that, you know, we'll, they will help us buy electric cars. They will help us with that infrastructure. Don't know how that's going to work. That's, a, excuse me, the Colorado Energy Office. <laughs> and they're a little bit behind on how they're going to work all this money, but and they're looking at it. Some of it is <laughs> what I heard in that webinar and some other things. Some of it's directly, or you get guidance from the USDA, the federal agency, state office in Denver. So the, the rural, I should say, rural development state office, a part of the USDA. Uh, and they were talking about, I think it was called community facilities grants for communities less than 20,000 like us. It's like 80% grants for some of these mm -hmm. things that yeah. either cities or schools or other entities can apply for. And I think we're really behind on that. So I, I definitely would like there's, to see that. There's yeah. just yeah. Yeah. watching this flow of money right now. It's, it's Brandy's going to be busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I need more Brandy's. We've talked about EV charging more lately. Um, and, and really, what it comes down to is we're how do we want to prioritize them? Where do we want to prioritize them? Do we want them on Main Street? Do we want them on side parking lots? Do we want them by adjacent to businesses? We have the ones where they are now because I asked them to put them adjacent to businesses downtown so we could have people walking into the stores. Ironically, the, the, the business owners downtown weren't happy with that. You know, I got nothing but you down for that problem. But you're well, tied up well, for an hour with a DC fast You're tied up for an hour to shop. But we also have potentially private developers in well, there's one in town right now that wants to put an EV station. Well, yeah, I think well, let's, let's explore it. Yeah. So yeah, how do we how do we move forward? How do you want to move forward? What what do the business people say? What was their problem? We have a problem with parking right now, and it takes staff parking away. So I would also recommend because that's in the same parking lot where Atmos is uh, parking their spectrum. or spectrum is parking their commercial vehicles like for their the private business and that is a public right. parking lot and we i get complaints about that all the time and now that we are using up some of those parking spots for electric charge i think we might need to pursue that because that is a private company and they need to be taking care of their parking exactly. somewhere else and we yeah. need that public space i know i don't know why we've kind of dragged our feet on enforcing that but i think we need to have yeah. some more conversations about that yeah. and there, oh, i'm just going to say yeah. quickly another thing to mention on electric sorry the infrastructure is that highway 50 is a national corridor that's mm -hmm. already kind of been mapped as being uh, a stretch of road all the way through colorado and elsewhere i'm sure where at least every 50 miles, there's going to be an installation of this four, four pronged charging unit. We don't know, you know, from the state's point of view, where that will land, but you can kind of guess Pueblo, Canyon City, and so on. So that would be an addition to whatever you just said. Just to go back to the spectrum vehicles, you know, that's a unpermitted lot. So, you know, we looked at making it a, a permitted lot to be able to push back on that as well. So that, that was part of the reason why we originally looked at permitting it was to be able to limit the commercial vehicles that would be well, maybe, maybe we need to sit down with downtown businesses again and have another conversation. Well limit it to three hour park. Well the, the well the thing is is we have residents that are living yeah. um, upstairs and they need to. a place to park yeah. overnight that's not taking up main street parking and so that's why we kept it for them so those residents are living there but it gets tricky when you have a business that is using it too and it's supposed to be for the general public. And we're getting more and more rentals upstairs. Yeah. Well I, I heard an interesting statistic today. Uh, it's the first time I've heard it. Uh, I don't know the validity of it or not. But what I heard is that one EV charging station is the equivalent of four average private residences with air conditioners. 
uh, in terms of energy usage. Uh, and so that's a, that's, you know, there's a, there's also a bigger picture here that we should not lose sight of. Well, it's, it's, it's going to happen that because this money is flowing. <laughs> well, that, that, I, I'm all in favor of getting grants and, and all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, well, there's um, that, that might be instead of there houses. Is, used to be, and I can't think of the right term, for utilities to where if you've right. got load increase, that doesn't come back to be, that's paid for by the utility. Mm -hmm. So as far as maybe working on some of that downtown stuff, that might be part of the thinking process. Too. And I know that the added, or at least I understand that the attitude is, Anybody can own these things. Uh, it can be a private effort. It can be the utility company. It can be the city, you name it. And they're not, at this point, going to try to control what people charge for the electricity. But they, they want it to be competitive, you know, sort of like so uh, similar they're to gas tele telecom is similar uh, in, in, in structure, I think. I mean, the, the companies come in privately and they, they just compete for everybody's business, which right. is what it appears to me that it's going to be like. But when it comes to the grid, um, I mean, Black Hills and all the other providers are out there all, all looking for alternatives and, you know, encouraging us to provide alternatives as well, you know, trying to do solar fields or whatever. Um, and it's, it's, it's less about power generation and more about the actual grid itself being able to, yeah. to support it. And, and when we have developers who are you know, called the Express, for example, we, you know, we put them in touch or connect with them with some grant resources if, if they wanted to put in electric charging stations, trying to um, see if the private market will take some, take some of the responsibility for building some of these. Okay. Are we ready to move on? <laughs> oh, look, we were already talking about downtown market. <laughs> I guess well, unless we move on, I guess we have a really six. big yeah. that's a big one. Big yeah, so turn the page, I guess, to the <laughs> part two of six. Just kind of going back to your question, Ryan, about the question marks one. Um, you know, from my perspective, people want to know what are their next and it's not kind of safe. So wherever we can build that into our street design, I think we should be. And personally, I'm a little bit, I don't think that we necessarily need to be planning new trails now. I think we need to figure out how we maintain all the trails that we've built before we start, you know, establishing these secondary trails that branch off of the Arkansas River Walk, or um, I think there was one more in here. So I mean, just from the sidewalks, bikeways, and trails portions of this conversation, that's where, that's where my head's at. I'll throw in one thing. Please don't do bike lanes like you did in Florida. If you've been through, if you've been on like Elizabeth and some of those other streets, they took a whole lane and made it into a. It's a protected lane. Actually, I'm a cyclist fan for it. So I, I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> yes and no. The other thing is, is that I understand it, but the trouble is, is the traffic on that road was enough to where, and I haven't worked in Pueblo, it's kind of like I went down there practically every day, and it was one of those to where it took the whole lane. I see no problem with having a bike lane and maybe eliminating parking along there, which of course in the homeowners mm -hmm. room about. But it's one of those to where it really created some issues. In fact, in, in fact, I think that they're actually still talking about this. I think it's 4th Street, they're talking about 4th Street at City Council about removing some of the bike lanes yeah. and there have people out there, you know, advocating <coughs> for them, please don't take away our, our bike lanes. So it's a balance, it's definitely yeah. a balance. Yeah, and especially, I mean, when we talk about complete streets, I mean, my candidate for the, the, the complete street would have been Main Street. That would have been my candidate for, but that that ship has sailed, and so we have to we have to adjust um, and 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 put shareholders or whatever it is to you know alert drivers that there are bicycles sharing their roads. That what they put in the lane? The, the, like, have the arrows? Yes. Oh, so, okay, no, so in in Colorado, the law is is we're allowed to as a cyclist to yeah. occupy the first third of the lane, and then the car can have the second two thirds of the lane. So those arrows are supposed to line up on that first third, and you're supposed to line your your tires up with those arrows. And people don't know that, but that's what you're supposed but to do. But it's a good visual reminder, and it's again a part of that education, a reminder to drivers that yes, bicycles have a right to exactly. be here. 
and you should be expecting them in this part of the roadway. And, yeah. And um, to, to your point, uh, Councilman Schmisher, um, the secondary trails, I don't think necessarily it's like new trails. I think it's more of a connection to everything. So it's, you know, connecting Riverwalk to other trails, you know, so to, to connect the Riverwalk to Ninth Street, to connect the Riverwalk to, say, First Street, you know, making those streets, you know, complete streets as much as we can. And some of what we talked about in the most moment. Mm -hmm. kind of exactly. Conversation is how do you connect? <clears throat> how do you connect me to the city downtown? But, but that's not trail. at all what it's six, said. 630 <laughs> is established. Yeah. So if it's about connecting, totally agree. But if we're talking about just establishing the trails, I think we need to figure out how to maintain what we've got. Agree. Plus, we're kind of like the bikeways that link, well, bikeways that link neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. A really big one for me is monitor, monitoring the demand for Fremont County Transit door to door shuttle service 639 because that is our only, yeah, 639, only public transportation that we have and we've got to keep it. And so they have been a part of the grant process as well. I have seen them at all the meetings. So they are, you know, fully, fully in, you know, engaged in getting more money. <laughs> trying to get more buses or, or expanding them to a bigger bus service, that kind of stuff too. It's, so. And, you know, talking with, uh, you know, Golden Age Center and, and their transit system, um, you know, some of the things that they need actually to refer back to the sidewalks and ADA accessibility. So mm -hmm. it doesn't do any good for them to have bus service and, you know, have to establish a route or something like that. And, uh, that's so there, there's a lot of things that get tied back together with other parts here. Mm -hmm. Good to know. The other thing, I, I completely agree, like our public transportation is almost non-existent, especially on a Sunday, you can get a cab on a Sunday. But 641 conducting a demand study to assess how some new services are relying on the information. I, I guess I'm confused as to why a study would be necessary. It seems like the Fremont County Transit Service would like to have the information as to how many people are calling them and asking them. So I completely agree that we need to do as much as we can to have more and better public transportation. I just don't know that that's the way to priority. Another thing. And that's just necessary to get more grant money or something, mm -hmm. but that's but, really something that yeah, anyway. There are some times that we, you know, we'll get calls that say call but people don't even realize that there is mm -hmm. that option. Right. So if they're not making, if the call isn't making it to, uh, Tool Nature Center than a free line kind of transit, then um, there may be an unmet demand that the study could find. Uh, then again, it may just be a wording issue, and they may be more around conducting a demand study for public transportation. Mm -hmm. The way that this is worded it now is very specific to senior citizens and the black communities. I think there's grant money out there for that too, for a study. Right? But a study. Okay. Oh, and, and, and as you see, we have question marks all the way across the board. And I was like, why study? Let's, we need it. Let's get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sidewalks 624 to 27. Um, so so um, <laughs> I actually got this question from a resident not too long ago about why we don't go and replace sidewalks. We don't have a funding mechanism to go and replace sidewalks. And truly, the way the municipal code is written, it is the property owner's responsibility to maintain and repair sidewalks. But we do have a very small program <laughs> that does help facilitate that. It's a grant program, and we pay for half based on a formula that we have, but it's very small. And the, the, the budget is very small. Um, but we do take, have a lot of people take advantage of it. That Sam has maxed out his budget probably the past three years of um, people taking advantage of it. Um, in, in, the, in regards to gaps in the sidewalk network, most of that is because we do not have uh, fully developed road sections where we have like ADA ramps to nowhere. And, you know, when we do spot development, then we have sidewalk, not sidewalk, sidewalk, not. And then, of course, 2A, we build curb and gutter, but we don't build sidewalks, you know, the, those kinds of things. So, and so, yeah. but schools, weren't we supposed to prioritize sidewalks so kids can walk to school? And here's what happened. Uh, like the Washington Street School that's on Washington Street there, that Discovery School, 
that place has like I'll bet a hundred cars everywhere mm -hmm. picking up kids because it's not safe for them to walk there. Mm -hmm. And this is the one on North Knight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, SRTS or the Safe Routes to Schools right, uh, funding yeah. mechanism. We have a project mm -hmm. for that. It is currently in design, and so um, we are going to do. Yeah. Right yes. Yeah. So that's six thirty-six thirty-seven. I'm sorry. Yeah. So again, so they've done Lincoln School's been done now with safe routes to schools. Um, CCMS, well, I don't, I don't know if that one actually CCMS. we were, but then we got uh, executed. I think we, we've done some around Washington. Uh, I think uh, uh, but exploratory is another one. Mm -hmm. That's the one that's in design right now. I believe. Yeah, so it is, yeah, so yeah, let's keep, and that's something that we do together with the school district. They're they're a big partner in that. So what, is this a two-year plan? It's ongoing. So ongoing. We'll, we'll, um, as we're starting construction for a Safe Routes to School mm -hmm. project, uh, we'll be uh, applying for funding for the next one. Mm -hmm. And so how far do those go? How, I mean, what's the extent? It depends on the allocation. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. um, it depends on the, at the time what the, the state allocation is, you know, at the time of school's different. Their needs are different for schools. Right, so, right. Mm -hmm. But it's like there's nowhere for them to be beyond on their bikes on that road. The road is so narrow. Mm -hmm. And there's just these high drop-offs. And the, and like Ryan said, I mean when we're working with the schools, that's what we're doing mm -hmm. is we're prioritizing with the schools, you know, saying what what is your goal, you know, for the safe route. And then they tell us. How about for the um high school? I know they had some safety issues on college. This meeting. Yeah, we're still working through that. We were working through that internally, at least trying to. <laughs> um, we don't have any priorities there right now, except for the possible bump outs that we want to put where the, the drainage comes in. We were talking about putting bump outs there. Right now, we only have a sign uh, that has people slowing down, mm -hmm. we hope. Um, but that's the intent is to put some bump outs at that intersection so that we get those kids some shelter before they cross the road at all. So neck it down so it, it kind of protects people. Right. So that's going to be a little college or is this? Um, like college in red. Yeah. A lot of speeding. Mm -hmm. If they use it as a racetrack. Well, and well, the principal is pretty, really, really concerned about the safety of his kids there. On yeah, college. Yeah, we've got one of the stand-up pedestrians. Yeah, it doesn't last. No. Yeah. <laughs> we've <laughs> replaced it. Like, we and it's still we, there. We've replaced, we've, we've replaced it in the, in three times in the year that I've been here. So that's a pretty big priority. Well, one of the other things that we talked about is mm -hmm. potentially putting a, steep, a speed table or something along those lines there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But I know the principal would sure appreciate if we did it and sooner than later. And we've and talked about Tony it. doing it in his um, his miscellaneous concrete project. We just have not done it yet. Well, can, can you explain what a speed table is? Yes. Yeah. A speed table is like, a well, yeah, I'm sure you've driven over one. They're like a giant speed, speed bump. Oh, well, you put yeah, your car over the top of it. Yeah, yeah, you put your car over the top of it. So it's kind of like you go up, over, and yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. It will. Still be there. It will. Voluntarily. Yeah. It Involuntarily. It freak you out if you yes. weren't expecting <laughs> <laughs> That's why we, we could paint it or not paint it. I want to see the first time. Yeah. 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 Take her hot one, don't Oh, no. <laughs> okay, community <laughs> facilities. Can I ask a question? Oh, oh sorry. 623, yes, you, you have a question in there. Should this be a city initiative? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why work with what? I mean, at the very least, it seems to me like that should be generalized and not just one business. Oh, 643? Yeah. yeah. But I didn't know if you wanted to. Yeah, we, we, we um, Get in trouble for picking resolutions. Yes. So this is a show. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's more a matter of marketing the entire community. That's more of an FCTC thing. Um, so I was I was a little puzzled by that one. And one one way you could change that is work with Rob Workshop earlier about uh, promoting the historic downtown. Mm -hmm. Are they still working on the mansion? Uh, you know, they've been kind of quiet about the yes, they since, have. Uh, COVID COVID, and that's what I was curious about. Are there other questions about this? Yeah, uh, yeah. Question mark on 644 uh, with regard to the railroad crossing. I don't know if, if that's <coughs> been a problem. 
Mm -hmm. Based on everything else, that's the priority of this area. So that, that we're at the whim of the railroad when it comes to that. I mean, we can work with them and partner them as much as we can, but putting a date on that is really hard. So if you, if council wanted to prioritize it right now, we might be done at the end of the front years of the planting. Right. We're just trying to get access permits right now, and that doesn't have really anything to do with them. <laughs> okay. Community facilities then. I wish to raise um, your first question mark on seven five. Um, does CCPL have they identified any uh, potential problems? Or? No, this was something that kind of came out of the the comp plan study, <coughs> but um, it's not something we actually discussed. Or like I think I would defer their opinion as to we. Uh, that's another one of those uh, resources is, you know, you know it, it, it's quite a bit to you know, make sure that the library operates on a regular basis. So I think that the second facility in time soon is uh, the entrance to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really, on um, 710 on preparing an updated master water report for the long term planning of the Travis water and I talked about it today uh, when we were talking about budgeting. Uh, we need to put that as a budget line item or consultant to do that. We also talked about um, whoever he picks needs to make sure that we have, they, they have the capability of doing um, a, uh, a water model because our current water model is out of date and that will identify a lot of areas um, and it uh, water master plan will also it becomes a planning tool as well as a CIP tool right now he has um, a very loose CIP program and he needs to use the water master plan report uh, to drive his CIP what is a CIP <laughs> Now, when it comes to developers, they do their own master plans for their development. So that master plan or water report, or sometimes we call them a feasibility study when it's like a, just a simple site plan, we talk about feasibility studies. And those usually fit in with the water master plan. Um, they have to usually refer back to the water master plan when they submit those to us. Um, tell me more about 720, undergrounding utilities as development occurs, especially in the downtown. So we're doing that right now, actually, over at fire station number three. When we asked them to, well, when they began the development process, they are undergrounding electrical and telecom. So that's what basically, when a site redevelops, then we have them underground the utilities. We pay for it or they pay, they pay for it. So, <laughs> yes. so uh, obviously, we've, we've got all the overhead lines in the, mm -hmm. in the alleys downtown. And, yeah. You know, we, we've uh, done some paving in, in the alleys. So, uh, if, if there are ever opportunities to try and underground some of that infrastructure, that that, that's what that particular item is referring to. And, and we also attempted to do it for the Rhodes Avenue project. We were not necessarily undergrounding the utilities, but we were trying to consolidate them onto one side of the street. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, due to that transformer issue we were talking about about 20 minutes ago, we were unable to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wonder on this whole, the whole little section on utilities, if we need to say a little bit more about what we're, that we have an energy committee and I don't know if that needs to be added in here what, what the activities I think I think that's a little bit separate from the comprehensive master plan I don't know I, you know I, if I were writing a new conference plan which I'm not I would I would really look to the future in terms of electric utility and you know if you were just going to make up 
a futuristic goal for any community. It might look like more of a distributed energy system, building it more renewable, whatever it would look like. Might be good to kind of think about that sometime and document it. So, in other words, we don't really, as a city, we haven't set ourselves a goal in that area or even written a vision of what we want that to look like in the future. We just kind of rely on our inherited investor own utility to make those decisions. And the city might think about that if it were up to us. But we that. Anything else? Let's move on to community character. Um, I'm curious for 8 1 and I did, has um, the 150th, they really wanted to invest in public art and it seems to be well received by the community. I'd like to maybe pursue that more, especially since we know more about. A lunar graphics <laughs> that might make it easier to put more public art in and more affordable to do that. We also talked about using it for the crosswalk art program. Oh, yeah. We did get um, awarded the grant for the downtown beautification for, and that included crosswalk art. So we we're talking about the lunar graphics using that because it might be easier to maintain and pull off or whatever it is that we mm -hmm. need to do as opposed to using paint and. Um, since we can't use our current printer, we talked about farming out the art yeah. to um, to somebody that can print it. Uh, we just need to start working on that, Rick. Start working on that. <laughs> <laughs> we also need two Ricks. <laughs> We've been trying, but you just there's just no clone out there of you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's some we're somewhat tied to the idea of creating an arts council too. Getting artists involved with the process. Yeah, and the Fremont Center for the Arts has got a lot of really amazing ideas to yeah. partner with. Is there, has anyone broached the idea of becoming one of the state, getting the state panel? If there's something like that, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, are we, have we started working on that? Anybody? Or? Uh, something on our wish list, but uh, okay. you know, that's one of those things that. Uh, Main Street Program Manager, or change the title to the Economic Development Coordinator. Um, you know, but you need more hours in a day, and the way we do it is um, so that's one thing that I would like to have. Um, in addition to the Arts Council, is having more of a downtown partnership with organizations, and they they right. could be involved yeah. with that. Well, you know, when you talk about everybody is. I'm very big on tech start, mm -hmm. but art creates a lot of businesses, and, oh, and, that's, yeah. and especially you know, tourist urban mm -hmm. economy. Yeah. That's you know, yeah. that great. I would say at the last at the last chamber after business after hours, I had it was ironic because it was just all about arts and all about the different talents we have in the community that don't even know each other mm -hmm. that exist, you know. Right. And and people who are already have made a business, they're mm -hmm. you know, they're seasoned business people. They're just kind of working out of their own little space mm -hmm. at home. And uh you know, if they all got together, they could bring other people on board. That's that's my goal was to bring them all together. Art start, that's my art career. Well, we've been talking about it. And yeah. there, there was actually somebody else who was talking about creating art start. Art. That's cool. So the word is out. The art start is out there. Um, based on a conversation we had at Downtown Colorado Inc., where we were one of the challenge studios, one of the things that came up was how a lot of our downtown businesses were really excited when we were applying for a grant to help them do some more facade improvements mm -hmm. and like like safety stuff. And part of that conversation was maybe finding a way that we can still increase that funding to make some of that happen. So I'm interested in eight six and eight seven based on that conversation. You maybe, I mean, it seems like we have pretty light URA meetings as of late. Could we maybe schedule a discussion session? Um, as one of the topics, oh, yeah, that, 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 that goes hand in hand with it, too. Yeah, that's a URA budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
it is with the URA now, uh, so we can have more discussion about that. Um, one of the other things that Rick and I have talked about for our urban renewal is uh, maybe another grant program for restaurants downtown, with kitchens, things like that. So again, try and generate more activity, which creates some kind of <coughs> restaurant uh, by downtown. Is the facade improvement? Is that taking down some of the newer fronts of it, like TZAC did, and bringing back some of the older things? These are smaller grants, so um, you know, you know, cleaning up some of the facades and things like that. Like so, new on, it's been used to like new awnings, like Fremont Provisions. Yeah. That was a facade Lights. grant. But they're relatively small. So part of the conversation yeah. at TCI was if we could make that funding pot a little bit bigger, then it might enable more people to do. Yeah, the thing that people got so excited about with the, the Main Street Open for Business one is that it was it was somewhat promising to pay for the entire project. So windows, you know, energy efficiencies, and that kind of thing. And there was a lot of it, way more interest than they ever expected. So we, we lost out. Yeah, they were really bummed when we didn't get that. Yeah, because some of those projects were tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Well, that money may come back, but maybe, but we also talked that maybe because we do have some money in ARPA that that's something we, you know, just to see to planting. That's also an consideration. energy efficiency thing that Black Hill should be interested in doing. Mm, I'll do it in the light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the cheapest thing to do. Um, we mentioned earlier about community pride and appearance at 819. Would kind of go hand with that with the neighborhood service teams to enhance neighborhood appearance and community pride. Just with regard to your question about 818, um, reviewing the nuisance ordinance in Bell 8, is that what we just did? We marked that one as done? Yeah, yeah <laughs> someone did the same thing. <laughs> that, that was the, the chronic nuisance that we just did, and we'll have second reading on. Mm -hmm. um, we, well, maybe you want to talk about Title Eight, so what we did a couple of years ago. Yeah, so um, once upon a time, Code Enforcement was part of the planning division. Um, and at that time, this was late 2018 into early 2019, there was an effort to sort of completely reshape Title IX, um, or I'm sorry, Title Eight. Uh, because Title VIII had a bunch of provisions in there that really had nothing to do with nuisance conditions. They were just sort of dumped there for lack of a better place to put them. So we completely retooled the whole section, moved stuff that was about um, floodplain issues to the proper section of the code that dealt with floodplain issues, moved things that were about moving violations into the proper section of the code that dealt with criminal violations or something like that. And then we restructured up to you know, how the process was going to work when it came to actually making contact with people at the property and if they were the tenants uh, rather than the owners of the property. We restructured all of that. That was a fairly comprehensive effort. Um, it took the better part of six months to completely get done and get the ordinance wrapped up and, and you know, approved by council. So, that was a fairly exhaustive effort that was relatively recent. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, as far as uh, the 818 goes, you know, probably be a good idea you know, maybe two years down the road to revisit that, and make sure that it's operating the way that it's ever going to be. Yeah. Um, I guess my conclusion stems that the one page but it sounds like the page should be better identified that way. Yeah, it could be. So everything that, um, yeah, well, I think we could probably push that one out. I have a question kind of goes into the code stuff. There was an email that talking about the changing the uh, the landscape of downtown and the types of businesses that were being encouraged to go in there. And there was an existing business that didn't quite fit in. It was like, it was a UD whatever, and I wasn't sure what that was. 
Does that ring any bells? We just saw it a few days we, ago. We have we have one. You know, we probably talked about this more than I think. One business staff had a question. <laughs> and it, 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 yeah. they didn't comply, and I couldn't figure out what it was they weren't complying with. They said this when we had started with a U, and I'm assuming it was urban renewal or something. Well, UDC is the Unified Development Code. Uh, okay. And uh, when we updated the Unified Development Code, there were some changes that were made as far as what the allowable uses are uh, okay. downtown. A lot of feedback we, we had you know, through the comprehensive plan process. Uh, when I was hired as the economic development director, was what do we do to reinvigorate the economic core in central business district? And uh, the, the recommendations from the, the planning company um, were to remove some of those uses mm -hmm. from around 44 uses. Which makes sense, but um, you know, some of those some of those types of uses over time. You know, your downtown commercial core is going to be better served to have retail and restaurants and uh, you know, those types of economic activities. Uh, so that that is what that email was about because uh, some of the, some of the existing uses, the legal non-conforming uses that are there now, um, would not be allowed in the future. Patrick and I have had some discussions. You know, Ashley was at that meeting yesterday. Um, but Patrick and I have had some discussions about you know, maybe there are some ways to conditionally or do a special review. Grandfather. Well, well the old ones are grandfathered in. Yeah, the old ones are grandfathered in, but a mechanism on a case by case basis to allow something if the council deemed it important. And it's a little bit tricky right now because we just adopted the new code, but we have all those old um, businesses there. And so someone like Perks who's moved in, they're like, well, there's already a medical facility here and a dentist here and something here. And so obviously it's okay for me to be here too. And so they just moved in and did it. And we don't have a process for business registration or licensing where we can have the opportunity before they sign a lease to say, okay, this is what the, the zoning is. And so it's, we're just really, I think we need to have some more conversations, at least through that transition period of going from old to new, and and maybe we rushed through this comprehensive plan so fast we didn't really think about some of the consequences as we go through those growing things. And See, I, the the rationale behind why the provision to have a number of these kinds of uses move to above ground floors in the psychological context of what you're trying to do is increased pedestrian activity in your downtown area because it is Bush to Ninth Street, that's, that, that comes range of blocks, that concentration. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is give them opportunities for window shopping, opportunities to see human scaled activity happening in these various storefronts. So that, that's why you put an emphasis on retail activities, that's why you put an emphasis on restaurants, that's why you put an emphasis on entertainment facilities, because that's what's going to draw interest if you're a pedestrian walking up and down the street. And I don't think at the time, I mean, I think we all agree, that's an appropriate goal to have with respect to how to apply zoning in a more restrictive way for this one particular commercial area in the city. I think that was... The goal was understood. Maybe how we thought about implementing it, we can revisit some of the decisions that got made. But I, I think I still think the goal is very worthwhile. I, just think we're gonna, I didn't mean to yeah. digress, but I just didn't mean to yeah, digress. yeah. And it, I think we'll have some more conversations because we're just kind of in a messy middle right now. And like I said, maybe we can make things a little bit easier. <laughs> there's, there's, there's always going to be teething pains when we we'll make this kind of a significant change. Sure. But it sure makes sense to have something built into the process that allows, before everything is final and done, allows a potential business owner to have that contact with the city where the city can say, you know, this is what the zoning is going to tell I you. I think that's, that's the business but, license. Conference. And I yes. think part of it, too, though, is that it's, it's not just medical, but it also means there's no accountants, there's no attorneys, there's no all these other regular office things that could be on the menu. And that totally makes sense for the river corridor, but I think, and it can make sense for First to Ninth Street too, but 
Well, and, and again, that, I mean, that this is given the current economic conditions right now, this may be something that we want to take a look at. Because it really limits the property owner's opportunity to rent out their retail, yes. their space. Yeah. 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 Something that isn't ADA, or would you rather have? Well, or a whole bunch is, of thrift stores and hairstylists. If you walk up and down Maine, as Andrea and I did last fall, you walk into a lot of interesting retail. I'll just leave it at that. It's not <laughs> necessarily what you would pick to have five or seven of in downtown. You know, it's not. So we should be careful, and that's just something maybe for future new looks at it, but if you're going to throw out medical attorneys and all that, but you have 10 tattoo shops or whatever, it's like... That's not super know. terrific either. Yeah. yeah, so it just so it we'll, takes more yeah. time. So <laughs> I think we'll, we'll need to bring this to a future discussion, so I think that... I'm, I'm glad that actually got brought up. Yeah, and so, if, but if you, if you eliminate those kinds of businesses from that corridor. Well, where they first, go. well first level. Yeah. So they could be on second level. On the second level. Second level is, is perfectly permanent. It's the first level that's the question. I think Ryan and I have had some ideas about you know, potential. Well, most of our second levels are just not conducive or ready for any of that. Well, and how many or most of them are Airbnbs now. Are there ADA issues? Yeah. Or, I mean, maybe not yeah. a lot of ADA issues. Well, and that was the other thing that came up is like, well, they maybe they could build or build stairs and figure out a second level thing. And like, well, does that mean they have to have an elevator too? Yeah, because and then it there. just. So, anyways, let's not digress yeah, too much. We gotta get moving. I, I do have a yeah. quick, just a quick comment on eight nineteen. That looks like I mean, if I were editing, which I'm not. That's not my job right now, but create neighborhood service teams to enhance neighborhood appearance and community pride. I think you could easily fold in that whole thing about community fire danger into that policy. And I guess I'll just say too, I don't, unless I missed it, I don't think there's a big category called public safety or something like that. And it was, I didn't realize it until I kind of got through the diet, it was like, I didn't see public safety. And so I know there's pieces of it here and there, whether it's police department stuff or code enforcement stuff, you might want to just think about. That's a pretty important thing <laughs> that we either provide or we're involved in with other partners. I think one of the most important things from my perspective is that this is not like the everyone at the city tells right. all of the city's priorities. This is like very specific. Planning development goals. Mm -hmm. yep. Are we ready for parks and open space? Any other questions on section eight? Um, do you want us to talk to the places where you put it in red? Or if if you have specific questions, sure. Mm. Yeah, I, just, I appreciate the time and effort that's clearly gone into updating this document. <laughs> Um, you'll, you'll see 814. That's something that you know, you guys said. That was, if anybody remembers, the uh, gateway to the authentic West. That was that planting plan. Oh. Um, so that, <laughs> that is why we exited out. We didn't think it was relevant. Yeah, that's so old. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about it? It's awfully ginormous. Do you yeah. have, did you kind of narrow down some things that your uh, staff is? I mean, we, 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 we talked a lot about it already. Yeah, sec section nine mm -hmm. is the place where we have the most questions. So, you know, a lot of it had, has to do with where do you prioritize some of these parks and trail type initiatives and, and where do you slot those in? To everything else. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Um, I mean, some of the question marks on the, the first page, so, you know, soft shell surface trails. I mean, we, I think we've heard from Councilman Smisher that, you know, we're not really wanting to prioritize some of that stuff, but, you know, kind of work on the stuff that we have. Maybe we, that would be put on the back burner kind of a thing. 
I mean, the, the only other thing I would say is that I do understand that we were going to prioritize the design of Red Canyon this year to make sure that we had more trails that are open to horseback and such. Yes. Yes. Not just horseback, but all yes. like ADA, um, horseback, mm -hmm. hiking, multi use. Thank you. Yes. Um, and I don't think that that's in here at all. Um, so it's not it's not that I think that we've developed all the trails that we need to develop, but I think we've developed a lot of trails and we need to make sure that we have a plan for maintaining the trails that we have and then prioritizing trail uses that maybe we don't have as much of that. And and Patrick just brought up a, a, a very important point. I mean, when we're talking about the mountain parks, they're not necessarily in, although they're in our jurisdiction as the parks department, they're not necessarily part of the so that could be why it's not here. They weren't in the city limits, so they kind of fell outside the scope. Yeah. Well, um, but if you go to 9.5, it does talk about opportunities for additional multi-use trails and parks. It does. And that. it talks about the Royal Loop and some of those things that are up in, in the Royal Board of Park. And but so. part of it, I mean, it is a priority that we can afford to maintain what we have and potentially build. Mm -hmm. um, and the mountain parks can be an important part of that conversation because now that we're charging for camping at the Royal Gorge, that's producing revenue. And it's enough revenue um, that that could potentially be used for maintenance of our trails. And, and if we can do the same thing at Red Canyon, the same thing at Temple, that then it starts to pay for itself. Yeah, and, and Rex's plan when it comes to the two mountain parks is, is more about establishing, first of all, um, designated really camping areas because right now people just do it willy nilly and I mean you have some areas that you're kind of designated but he would really like to have spots that are designated that could eventually turn into fee type of areas so I mean you, for, you first have to establish the areas right. yeah. you know with firings and all that other stuff so and then you can work on you know uh, establishing the, the fees and stuff so the, the, they are definitely on his radar for sure we just you know need to know of course, most of what's going on inside the city limits is more of a priority, and but he is dedicated staff that work on and, well. and speaking of staffing, I mean that can be a staff person's job. We actually Rex and I met with somebody who that was their job. I think it was in Durango when they lived in this area now, and they almost, I mean, using the the revenues from the campgrounds plus that person, they also are the ones that are aggressively going for grants and fundraising sure. and doing all those things so they help pay for their own position. So those are things that, I mean, even though it's not specifically in here, that might be one of our priorities. Yeah. So, I so but the design of the right If I remember correctly, it was a conscious decision at the beginning of the planning process where we said we're going to restrict our, our vision to within the city limits. There were lots of issues up at the, up, up the Royal Gorge Bridge and some of the property up there that uh, you know that is looking at being developed that looked like it was going to be a real can of worms to try and do some planning on. Uh, but so because of that, I think that we dropped the ball then on, on the trails. So I, I think that if I remember right, I think that's really kind of how that happened. Yeah, I think you know th there was a priority put on within the city limits. Yeah. Uh, it, you'll see John Griffin Park shows up in here that uh, through the planning process that that is identified as prior to annexation area. So that's part of the reason why that shows up there. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're actually good. Without knowing all that history, it just seems like we want to be sure we address whether it's Royal Gorge, city owned property, mountain parks, in addition, you know, the garden park and Temple Canyon. Seems like we want to have some kind of planning document process for that. And we really and we really need to. When and when with that parks planning document, whether it's parks, parks open space, parks open space and trails, whatever that mm -hmm. plan looks like, that's something that we need to talk about when it comes to the code too, because right now the code um says that if should somebody um want to give park land, then it goes to council about approval. To you know, approve that parkland, but we don't have any provisions saying that, you know a certain amount of development requires parkland or anything like that. And we really need that because right. when you get new developments, say like the Abbey, I mean, I granted, I know the Abbey is going to do a great job holistically when they're coming when it comes to planning it. You know, making sure there's open spaces and parkland and that kind of thing. When we have a giant pond up there too that we can use in parkland, but um, <laughs> the, the the point is is that when we get to those planning documents. 
to make sure that we are providing those parks and open spaces for mm -hmm. the people that are going to live there. And that doesn't, that is not addressed. Right. So, I mean, when we we're talking about requirements of a certain of developments of a certain size that say, well, you have to have a pocket park or you have to have a major right. park or whatever, but that will help Rex right. later on down the road. That way he would know, say, okay, I have a major park coming up in this area. I'm going to need three more staff or I'm going to need this much more time or whatever it is that he can plan for those things. So we need to talk about that as, as a group as well, you know, making sure that that is addressed in the development. But couldn't part of that conversation be that some of those neighborhoods could have their special district that pays for the maintenance exactly. of those parks too? Exactly. Yeah. And we do have a case for the county trails open space for the reporting of plans. So there are, there is a lot of work that has been done oh, on developing. I know. I just think we need a city focus on city owned stuff. <laughs> at the very least and yeah. then in addition oh, development, you mean so. not pathfinder park and all these other things <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what is that <laughs> <laughs> and just on 97 i know we talked briefly about the royal group before i think far is looking at a grant for the watchtower extensions i think oh, is that uh, i think the city really does still need to follow up with the royal group bridge company about the liability issues and see how we can actually make sure that and just a quick comment on 914 and 920, there may be somewhere else, but just where we're referencing supporting an aquatic, aquatic which we can't speak, recreation center. I would like to see that language stay in here. We don't know how it's going to happen, but we do know it's a community need. Just in a general sense, <clears throat> we know we are a size of the community that needs a recreation center of some sort. So I would hate to yeah. just well, let I it get lost. Think, um, aren't they keeping? Isn't the Abbey keeping that land? Does right. it, you know, right now, earmarked? Yeah. They, they, the Abbey development still has hopes that some way, one way or another, that there could someday be a community. Rob, Rob Brown of FEPC and I are going to talk more about this because it's something that's most likely going to have to be private or public private to happen. Um, it may not be, you know, it, this is my concern throughout the entire process is that if it doesn't become a public thing, it doesn't become a public. You know, the community, the community that was complaining because they didn't want, because poor people couldn't use it or um, elderly were going to have to share space with youth, you know, all those arguments. If we get something private now, the poor people won't be able to use it. You know, you know it's there, it's going to backfire with people. So coming up with a way to do it publicly and privately, it, we're going to we're going to be exploring those mm -hmm. options. It's probably going to be mostly private. Maybe we'll luck on some billionaire who wants to improve <laughs> their public. Well, we've well, well, got some billionaires in this community. Yeah. Okay, you two are in charge. Well, John Harry, I do have this saying that if times were good, everybody would be happy. Um, and economic economic development is really the driver that brings people to the community, businesses to the community that can help all of this happen, right. but um, there's always that chicken in the egg. I'm not sure what the chicken or the egg right now. <laughs> and I, I have a comment on 9-6, the wheels uh, to trails. There is a movement and there are grants, and considerable grants to this irrigation ditches. That is a huge, huge challenge moving into the future because right now they they evolved from ranchers in very simple operations, very little funding. <clears throat> You'd be amazed how little funding these stitch companies have to do what they have to do. So at some point, it might make sense, and there's a lot of funding right now to enclose the water flow. And make that a trail. Yes, there's money for that. Yes, we're, we're talking about it for the Abbey and for the multimodal master plan. That is one of um, the hydraulic is one of the areas that we have targeted for a possible trail 
regional trail? I've walked, I've ridden the trail, the entire length of the trail with another gentleman in town who has, who really wants to have this happen and uh, its board member um, to discuss how that could happen. Because the, that, yeah. that's a key one. Because the function of running these ditches, you know how it was, they have to burn off all the ground. That's us solve a lot of problems. And then and the, the trash, like you've seen the trash that's collected in these ditches. <clears throat> and, and there's just these little ditch companies that have to deal with all that trash. Well, and all the growth that takes the water. Yeah, and, and you've got evapor evaporation now in the ditch. It would solve a lot of problems, yeah. and it, it erodes people's personal property a bit too. Right. You know, I mean, you can build. Well, it's back it's back right up like it's all private property. It's all well. It's, it is. It, it just keeps getting right wider right. and wider and wider. So people's. I mean, there's a ditch that comes right up to a house. Really? She wasn't built that way. Wow. It comes right up to the corner of the house. Well, there's a there is a house that is owned by someone who built a bedroom, a spare bedroom. Over the top of the ditch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all right, but my point is, <laughs> if you can pipe them and you can fill that in, right. you can increase that yeah. property. Exactly. Exactly. Yards. You, you but, just have to be careful because we have this issue yeah, like careful. over um, by the hotels that everybody wants to enclose the hydraulic and the tailwater over there, but then they forget it's there, which means that they cannot, they, they cannot, there. they right. cannot build on it. They yes. can't, yeah. and they forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so irrigation irrigation companies are not like utilities. We are not they're not required to go out and mark and and locate all that stuff. There's no way they can do all that. But they still are responsible for you know anything that gets broken or yeah. I think you might have to do some marking. I think it was recent legislation. Yeah, just a minute. Uh, with regard to the recommendation, I know there's a question mark that's something that I think we'd be able to do with the working position. Yeah, so they move that one up on the priority list. I think it's a safety issue. It, it, it is, especially with Oil Creek, and you know, it depends on what happens with um, the old Clark Station property. With this one, it will probably come up before soon. 971. And then there's talk, well, I should have heard some of the teachers. When you talk about so that, moving that. Oh, well, there is one. It's old. So I wasn't sure how many, how much I wanted to continue to implement the project since I identified it. It's a, it's getting a little bit obsolete. <laughs> It has some stuff like a, our, a big like concert venue. Oh, we're looking yeah. the um, it's like a sketch yeah, or something, isn't it? Bridge. It also sketch. has yeah. big hotels and golf yeah. courses because you know you're gonna have all this water and sanitation <laughs> and like Ty's kind, of, Ty's kind of, and it's all county land, and so and that was a priority of the previous a couple of mayors ago. Uh, really just tie, you know, utilizing manhandling county properties to do what they wanted and huh. for the Royal Gorge. And it had, and it just had some things, I think uh, like a, like some dentistry museum or some other museums, but we've gotten that in another place. And so, yeah, it's. So, yeah, it's. <laughs> Especially as we have more discussions with the bridge company, and you know, when the city has to make decisions and we continue with the current company, or we put that under our feet, having uh, discussions about the future vision of, of what's going to happen out there is uh, yeah. probably the appropriate time to have it. And what's written really all those plans that we've had now, we've actually built a trail system there. So, yes, I don't know how. Sorry. Yeah. 
this time frame out there. Knowing when the contract expires, so it's probably a warrant or something like that. And I do like having some more wayfinding for the hogback open space. The wayfinding for hogback. And that's it's in the nine thirty area. Well, nine twenties. And not just that, but it's also coming down from Skyline and going to downtown. So, so that can be finding. We do have the wayfinding sign um, plan. Uh, we were still concentrating on the bigger signs and Highway 50 and, and branching out. He has um, money in the budget every year for those wayfinding so signs. So maybe doing some more, a little bit more, just every year, just do a little That's bit. That's what we're doing. And this year we bought um, the hardware that goes to the signs because those big signs are so expensive and they have to be specially printed. And I think we've lost two this year on Highway 50 due to accidents. So. Mm -hmm. We have to replace those before we can buy new ones. But um, that, that's the intent is he was buying hardware this year and he was going to uh, put the money next year towards more science in that plan. So so I'm confused. Mm -hmm. On 922, the third street corridor is the primary and best access to the hog exit. They're on the fifth street. There is, there is access. It, it, tur it turns into a dirt road right before it hits the hill. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for biking and hiking. Yes. Yeah. But is that the best access for tourism? Well, from Skyline 50, but the cars come down. Yeah, from Skyline Drive, they come down on the fifth. But this would be, it's that whole complete streets thing that we were talking about earlier, that that corridor between yeah, Sunny Hills and Park Office. No one knows that that's it goes somewhere. Yes. <laughs> I, read this, I read this meeting right now because obviously the way that you do it, but we would like to, as part of the reimagining third, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. people to use third access mm -hmm. Exactly. So that is, especially as you have people leaving the train, you want the third to be. That, gotcha. that window. So yeah. it's a the yellow brick, brick road. road. Yeah. It is a yellow brick road, literally on the Centennial Park Master Plan. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing how you're learning so much. <laughs> 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 Are there other items at nine where you know, anybody has any strong feelings about? So I'll just speak up again on 990, 91, 92, that area that I just want to be sure that we And when it talks about restroom facilities at trailheads, the only one I'm really thinking of is hogbacks. That's what I've gotten the most public or citizens reaching out wanting restroom facilities at the hogback. Sure. I think it's the kind of surprises me. It's probably a construction issue, I would say. Probably. Um, just based on the geology. The geology. Yeah, topography and geology, I would think it would be a, a challenge. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it will cost money unless yeah. we do something like a vault similar to what we did up in uh, up in the park. So just something to think about. Well, probably in the parking lot. That's oh, well, we're under the control of the unit, uh, the U.S. <laughs> um, Corps of Engineers when it comes to the river, so we have to manage that process through them. Um, any any development that happens within the floodway or the floodplain has to be approved. So um, that this is more of a development type of a um, uh, topic. So we'll have to just watch it very carefully. Um, because there's going to be, you know, specific needs and and necessary construction measures when it comes to 
constructing in the floodway floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you want to, it to be aesthetic as well. Mm -hmm. So when we're, th th we're talking about aesthetics as well as functionality, the, the river has to be primarily functioning as a river. Exactly. And then, and it is I guess yeah. my, my question is more like, do we need a city council or policy or ordinance or something? Or I, I'm, when, when there are things that are like protect and ensure and promote, it's like what is the actual item, action item around this? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a good question. It's, you know, it's controlled by the Corps of Engineers. It's actually a state park. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what authority we actually have. Um, I think it, it it's more about the development side and making sure that as we're going through the development review, that we're not allowing anything to be overbuilt. Um, that's mm -hmm. and, and some of that um, also showed up back in the Arkansas River section. Um, some of those action items. I think 953, we've already talked a lot about. That's the Third Street connection. Um, and I'm not seeing it specifically under parks. It was actually under a different section, but about the river, like this, the banks of the river being more aesthetic. And I, I see a priority, obviously, at Skyline still oh. at some point. Mm -hmm. I think it's 965. Can you remove old industrial zone from oh, yeah. yeah, and we, we've actually talked about that. I um, briefly met with, uh, um, I, I'm sorry, the, the name escapes me, but it was one of the rafting folks that RG we were, Rio. yeah, RG Rio. Um, and we were talking about more uh, just temporary type of accesses, you know, behind Skyline Steel and using that property. Um, they wanted to do some, you know, some temporary types of things, at least until we get developed. And I think that as that area gets developed, it's, you know, I think it would be important to keep a similar look as what we have on the Centennial Park side, mm -hmm. where, you know, we have the large boulders, you know, mm -hmm. the, the protection that it takes to, not that when a great flood comes, those little boulders are going to make much difference, but, you know, in the smaller. But it looks good as they're rolling. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you're, you're keeping the aesthetic of, you know, kind of a matching corner on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to go back on the developer. We just have to manage yeah. during the developer process. The de developer or, you know, there are some grants out there that we, you know, in partnership with our team, we have done the mass. I think that kind of goes back to 949 as well, you know, wanting to, you know, bring up those banks and if there is concrete or rebar in them. And there is. I was going to say that it could be a partnership to some extent with RGP. You know, so, you know, Whitewater's this weekend, the funding they get from Whitewater goes to the river, mm -hmm. goes to this, these types of improvements. So, um, and they have a very keen interest on the health of the river and the banks of the river. So, um, Accessibility as well. Accessibility. So, you know, working with an organization in the community is always a good thing. Sometimes it pains you up, but uh, publicly it's a good thing. Funding wise, it's a good thing. I think that's important that the river continues to be accessible for everyone. Yeah. Just people who have fancy equipment so they drive away. There's still a huge trust in the river. And our river, our river section here, and, and when we had the open canoe, uh, national the last weekend, two weeks ago. I had to wonder if they weren't happy with us because our river was way too accessible because we had people in the line of the gates, you know, waiting through the line of the gates. Whereas in EV, you can't really get on the river. So they had all access to the river in EV. They loved it here, from what I understand. But um, in RG Rio, too, they want to make sure that everybody, that's what the, the loaner station is for. Get everybody. It's, it's a big priority. So nine sixty, isn't that already? Uh, I don't know. State mandated thing. Uh, employ the green stormwater designs. Well, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say gray area necessarily uh, when it comes to <coughs> stormwater design. It, it's. Um, there are many ways that you can handle stormwater. Stormwater, you can manage it the way of the LA River and have concrete banks and concrete. You know, it's it's all up to the, you know, the designer and then of course the city that's allow it that allows it to accept it. Whereas we have, you know, um, at least from what I understand and from my my perspective, it's more towards a holistic 
green natural way of handling stormwater. It's also cheaper and it takes up less property and those kinds of things. Whereas, you know, you can still legally do everything with concrete and rocks and that kind of stuff. It doesn't look great. It does, it works, it works perfectly fine. It cleans up the water, but is that what we want? I think is what it's going for. So that there's one way there and how you do it. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, that would be the Pueblo solution, where they have <laughs> big blocks of concrete yeah. everywhere. I don't see anything with, well, maybe because it's not really in our control yet, but the um, park station property too, and potentially developing there, that. I, there was there one. Was back in the Arkansas River. Oh, okay. There was one. Uh, 5D is extend the river excuse zone to the Black Hills Energy site. Oh. But that's really just about the zoning. Right? They can't really do much with that. It's just open space. It, it is about the zoning, but you know, the shit done on that property is very limited because of all the easements. Where the cleanup is, that location. But I mean, as far as accessibility to the river and more open space and parking for the riverfront development, that is a priority. Those, those are lots of opportunities. If we can, you know, make that a reasonable position. Uh, still having discussions. I think we're making progress, but they have tendency to go dark for long periods of time. We need to be kept on the ship. And then Emily, there's lots of fire mitigation stuff on the last page. <laughs> <laughs> Except in my packet is the last page, second to the last, so I can just got stapled on my <laughs> special too. We had talked when we, Emily and I had sat down with Michael Kroll that does the emergency response for the county and with Chief DeVecchio. And we actually did talk about maybe exploring a local slash and shipping program for residents. So I, I which is on there. Chief just with that. The fact that, that one of the things we talked about is that there's just more state money becoming available for this kind of stuff too. Uh -huh. and, probably just need to look at that more. There's just newer legislation that's providing grant money or whatever for fire mitigation. So we do have some neighborhoods that are really high risk yes, for yes. Um, urban inter wildland interface. Or even just in the middle of town where there's maybe more brush and weeds and so forth. And there's... I thought, um, I think obviously it would be much better if it was grant funded. But I think one of the things that we saw from the storm was so much tree debris. Is there, are there other things that we should be exploring in terms of having a city chipper um, that we could then use the mulch? Or like, are, there, are there other options that we should be looking We actually for? just spoke about this earlier today that we're, we've got the chipper on the, the budget. We do have a chipper and the you know the truck that takes care of it. You know, um, we are looking at a new chipper, but we're having trouble with the company coming down to demonstrate one. They don't have any in stock, um, so to even get a new one, um, it's, it's been a process for Rex. And um, he's had he's got it in the budget. He's going to have to roll it again to next year until we can actually get some demonstration to see how it works. So some of the other issues that we've had in the past is with the chip and mulch it. Mm -hmm. Or nobody comes to get, you know, yeah. wants to use it, and then we yeah. you know, citizens we, end up having to pay to have it taken to the dump. We, we have piles and piles of it. But, but there was a really big demand after that storm to provide a place where people could take their branches mm -hmm. to get it chipped. Even if we do just throw it away, or even if we do this slash program for fire mitigation, it's like, well, we need to find a place where we can take it and burn it. Mm -hmm. And, and, some of the stuff I've talked to is like, yeah, I'm available and do this. Other staff's like, this is a lot of work and that's really annoying. I don't want to deal with it. And I think as a 
council, we need to decide, is this a priority when we have these big storms? Do we want to be customer yeah. service well, oriented? Howard, Howard charged but, 20 yeah. bucks a trailer load. And we had one neighbor who was on the board with me up there and he had 15 trailer loads. Right. He had 20 bucks each. So, and the other piece of that that's related, and just speaking of my own experience, I still have not found a local tree service who will take the pile of branches off my property from the storm in May. So, and I oh, even yeah, talked to Rex about, who would you recommend? Okay, I, I'll call him. I called him in May and couldn't get him. And yeah, so I called him again. Oh, I'll send my guy Monday. Well, that was two days ago. Oh, so it's, yeah, it's tough. It is tough. Mm -hmm. I have called six or seven different companies. It's just got a yeah. requirement. So it's business. Yeah, well, I, it's but there. I've seen other yards that still have branches in it, and they don't. Or they don't even have a vehicle to get rid of it. And I've had another senior citizen who's like, "I am a single elderly woman, and I have all these branches, and I have a little tiny car. Right. What do I do?" And it is a fire hazard. What I have is a fire hazard. There's also the fields that are going on, and so contact with because a lot of people are new to the community and don't are not familiar with you know pine trees and that type of thing and how this tree is dead the next one's gonna be a week. Going back to your question actually I think given the demographics of our community it's absolutely something that we should be offering as a customer service. It's being nice if we could. I don't know if we're just a few minutes about this if we have to do the cost benefit analysis of do we have the staff? Can we actually buy a chipper? Is a chipper available for sale? Mm -hmm. I absolutely think that it's something that we should be exploring. Or even mm -hmm. offered on a lower, you know, maybe somehow to split cost with the homeowner or something mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And that is what can, what are the options? Are there options for selling the mulch? We try. We, we tried yeah, giving it away for free. Right. And you know, first, the other challenge is, is when we have these storm events. You know, not only did we utilize all of our park staff, we used all of the street staff and water distribution staff yeah. as part of the cleanup. So our staff is very good. For nearly a month. Yeah. For yeah. nearly a month yeah. for all three departments. And that was. Theoretically, just for city trees, trees in the city right away. Right. Right. Even though I'm sure you got a little bit. Uh, yes, we did. <laughs> Not at my house. <laughs> I kind of wish I had. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate that. It's a big pile. But that goes towards is this a priority? And then if it's a priority, then we need to explore a little bit more yeah. how we can make it happen because we can have come up with a million reasons why not to, but we right. can also find solutions. Especially if there's some fire mitigation. All right, so we made it through all of those hundreds of items. <laughs> so what's next? So did we do anything to help you? <laughs> <laughs> so what it boils down to. I, I think you know, this is going to be an ongoing process. So you know, what, what we were hoping for tonight was to identify some items that we what are some of those priorities uh, so we can slot them in? Uh, but I think on an ongoing basis, you know, some of these things will stay as question marks or long term. And every year, as we get ready for budget, we're going to be going back to this document and looking um, for what, what else is on the list. What are some other things that we need to do? Uh, obviously, as we have development projects that come up, we're, we're you know, it's ongoing things mm -hmm. we're, we're keeping our. Um, make sure that's that's top of mind when we're reviewing types of projects. So, uh, especially as we're looking at development starts to pick up, um, making sure we're making the most of the staff level <coughs> items that um, bubble up as a priority for council or the council needs to act on. Um, <coughs> Can I ask when we're um, getting together with the budget or when we present it to our flag or as we are asking for this because this is yeah, that, that is one of the goals. So, um, and I talked about that during one of the staff retreat or the city council retreats is as items are you know, being put into the budget because of action plans, um, not just this one, but <coughs> the other action plans as well. But, um, we're very careful to identify where that's coming from and why this ask is coming from. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it seems like almost all of the vegetable items would have an action, something from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. they should. I'll just say one more quick word about fire. I believe <laughs> I read online that there were five lightning caused fires yesterday in Fremont County. Oh, yeah. So, so, it was crazy, wasn't it? Oh, yesterday? Yeah. And remember, they, they don't, the lightning doesn't stay out of the far city boundaries. Mm -hmm. and it comes in. All right. Well, good job, Council. How, what do you think? Did you like this? Well, yes. This? Yeah. I think it was way yeah. more productive. Yeah, you know, it's easier to see folks. And it was, and we all could just chip in as needed. And we had some really good conversations. So, and thank you, staff, too. This is a lot to, to manage. I mean, we get to talk a lot and see a lot, and you guys get to do all the work. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When the rubber needs to yeah. go. Yeah. This is for those budget requests. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's power for you too for those. All right, thank you. Thank you.